Hey guys, this podcast is brought to you by Sacco Sportswear. Sacco Sportswear is a local business based in Barrie and they produce the sportswear and training gear that you may need. Their stocks include tracksuits, hoodies, t-shirts, socks and so much more. If you're a local team or even a local football club that wants to provide the best kit for their team to play in, then Sacco Sportswear is the business to turn to. Even if you're not into football, but are into other sports, Sacco Sportswear also provides you with the best gear when you go to the boxing gyms or even play rugby, tennis and so much more. They don't just do training gear or any outfits at all. And if you're just looking for something to wear in general, then they also provide the leather so outfits as well. if you're interested and want to inquire, then get in contact via social media. If you want to look them up on Facebook, just type in Sacco Sportswear. On Twitter, it's at Sacco Sportswear, no capitals and no gaps at all. Or even on Instagram, same again, Sacco Sportswear with no gaps. Or even then, if you want to send them an email, it's at Sacco Sportswear at gmail.com. They won't disappoint you, so get in touch. Sacco Sportswear on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email again on sacosportswear at gmail.com. Hey guys, welcome to the Dragon's Voice podcast. I hope you guys are doing well and uh, keeping safe and everything. And this is, I think, the 51st episode now. So I hope you guys have been enjoying all the uh, previous podcasts. And also thanks to our sponsors, Sacco Sportswear, for supporting us during this time and to get the podcast up and running and towards the the next step as it is you know and make sure you follow us on youtube make sure you like share subscribe to the channel you know and if you want to follow us on Podbean, it's dragon's voice podcast make sure you follow us on twitter at dragon's voice 20 um make sure you follow us on facebook and everything like that we haven't got instagram because i, I got fed up with instagram so uh but it's it's just simple facebook twitter and youtube and obviously popping so uh, make sure you guys are keeping yourself up to date but without further ado we got to keep going with the guests and um uh, and uh, luke williams will be back soon um but this time uh, i got a very special guest uh, not a footballer this time not a manager or anything like that this is a man who's uh uh, made a pretty name for himself because of one one simple th- uh, idea that just blew up, uh, I suppose, and it was the spirit of 58, and it's none other than Tim Williams. Tim, how's it going, buddy? All right, mate, see you. Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. So, yeah, I mean, I... the the guy, spirit of 58, I've seen your shop in Bala, um, and I saw, uh, you know, how spirit of, spirit of 58 just exploded you know came onto the the Welsh football market as they say but I want to um, know some stories about you you know but beyond the the facade of uh, Spirit of 50 AC what your, your the best games or the worst games so um uh I, I heard you you'd wreck some supporter so I, I suppose that it all started from there um so how did it all began for you and uh, what was what was the reason that you fell in love with uh, with the football in Wales then um, I'd put it down to my dad to, to start, like many sons. Um, we inherited the uh, love of the game from uh, our fathers, really. He was a big football man. And, um, yeah, and uh, he was a big football player back then. And, um, you know, obviously, I, I followed in his footsteps in a lo- for the love of the game. But he was rather, he was more of a player than me. And I was more of a spectator, let's put it that way. But he was a he was quite a good player back back then, and um, he wasn't so keen on watching football. He, he was quite a cynic, really, and a lot of them that generation probably were um, because um, you know in today's sort of climate, then it's a world away from when he started playing football. I think he was playing for Bala first team at the age of fourteen, um, which is. Quite a, quite some time. So, yeah, I think a lot of us uh, lads inherit inherit the, um, the 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 love of football, uh, basically down to your father. Also, like in the game as well. You see, you know what? I, I really wanted to mention um, well, with your support for the love of the game and everything. And I I wanted to just jump straight into the you know the the dragons then or into the fire pit as they say you know with Wales going to watch Wales away but what was your first Wales game and also what was your first Wales away game as well um, the first home game I can recall and I'm, I'm convinced this was my first game maybe not but um 
it was when Wales played Russia in um, the race course and we drew nil-nil. That's the first memory of going to actually watch a match of, of, uh, with my dad. And, um, you know, back then it was a big deal for somebody from Bala to go as far as Wrexham um, in the, um, you know, in that generation. Now, you know, we travel far and wide these days, but he, his Saturdays were spent actually playing football. So I, you might class myself as a bit of a late starter. I think I was age nine at the time. I probably went to my first game with my dad and, a, and one of his friends and, uh, and another lad from Ballow still follows Wales away to this day. Like So that's when it all started for me. That's the first memory of watching Wales in, in a... It was a very hot day and we played a very good Russian team. We got a nil-nil. And my, my lasting memory was the cop at Wrexham when you could actually stand on it. And it was absolutely packed. And we were stood at the front of the, the, the stand, what is behind the goal then, um, because, you know, most of the younger kids did back then with their fathers down at the front, rather at the back, where it was a bit more, let's put it this way, a bit more lively back then at the back of the cop, because, um, you know, believe it on, you know, there was a bit of inter-club rivalry back in the 80s. So uh, as a young child, I probably my dad said, no, you're coming down the front with me. <laughs> so I probably held his hand throughout the game. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the uh, the first Wales uh, away match that you did then? The first Wales away game we did uh, was in 1991, um, Belgium away, which I think... But a lot of lads my age, I'm 50 this year, was probably either their first or second game ever watching Wales. I know different generations. I know fans who've been going since the 70s. But for me as a 19-year-old and a group of lads from the same village, Mbala, that was our very first game. And it was, you know, we um it was a major thing for us back then because you know, a lot most of the crowd that went still follow Wales away now. But um, it did did put a couple of the lads off from going again as well because, you know, there was quite a bit of trouble over there that, that, at that time. So um, quite a lot of uh, deportations, which uh, um, there was a bit of inter-club rivalry going on then. It's a world away from uh, watching Wales away now these days, to be honest. Mm. Do you know what I really wanted to know some because considering that you've been away to Wales a lot, right? And this is someone, I mean, I, I'm in my mid twenties now, and uh, I've never been to watch Wales away, and I think that that's a bit of a, a bit of a shock for some because uh, I've got mates who are younger than me who've been to watch Wales away, but I've never really had that. I mean, I had that sort of love for Wales, but I think it was just the money and the the money and uh, the sort of people that uh, I was with that didn't really go to watch Wales away. So, um, um, but I've managed to get myself a, a Red Wall membership and I'm looking to get another one, hopefully when they release uh, another one in the future. But yeah. from from your experience, and if you if if there's people watching this or listening to this now, um, how did you try, how, how am I going to say this now? How simple, How what was the plans back in those days in the 90s when you were trying to arrange a, an away trip or something? Is it Was it simple? Was it difficult? And like what it is now? Or was it complete? Or how different was it, if I'm trying to ask you? So just tell us your story, really. Well, it's um, a world away from what happens now because everybody has got use of mobile phones and the internet and... Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think that was available back then in 1991. So all, everything that was organised as a group of friends was done in the pub, basically. And we did everything through the local pub. You know, we all met there on a weekend and we discussed what we'd do, the, you know, to, um, to how to travel, basically. And um, watching Wales was something that came naturally, being a, you know, a football fan. And a group of lads who were all into the same thing back then. Um, mm. We were all into going to watch live bands and going to watch football. They were the two things that brought us all together from an early age. And um, I think it was more an adventure then. It was a lot more planning involved because, you know, these days you can fly off to wherever you want to watch football. And you could be back the following day. But then it was more an adventure where you'd be away for three or four days or even a week. And that was so, that was the good thing about it. Like it was the unexpected and, um, you know, 
maybe a lot of us, we were young lads, you know, uh, a lot of us in college. Um, but as I say, most of the trips that we organised back then were done in the pub and after there were a few pints. Um, but um, no, it was great days, they were, to be honest. Um, the days before mobile phones, as I say. And um, you'd spend longer away, I feel, than you do now, you know, because I've got a family now and uh, got responsibilities. But back then, you were a bit, we were a bit more carefree. It was the, it was the 90s as well, the early 90s. And there were good times, good fun times where, you know, uh, the music scene was good. And um, the football and the music went hand in hand for us back then as a group of lads. We, we were all into the same clothes, into the same music. And into football, so um, you know, there were really, really good times there. Right? I know through away when you're trying to arrange a, um, tickets for an away matches, uh, obviously you um, the FAW nowadays they release right. This is how many how much tickets were given to the away followers, and they go through a, a structure. I'm, I, I imagine. I mean, I've, I've had friends of Barry Town trying to tell me this. It's like, wait, this is the structure. I'm thinking. Well, so, uh, but it goes by people who are, who have been members, let's say longer. So they get the first time because they've been there longer. So yeah. uh, uh, if I'm right in saying, but going back then when you're trying to order tickets, how, how was that, you know, accessible? You would probably do, I think there was a membership scheme back then, even, you know, not on the same level it is now. And obviously it was fairly easy to get to Brussels even though that meant, you know, getting to Bala, to London, we took a minibus. Um, but, you know, that was a big game for a lot of Welsh fans back then because Brussels, Belgium was quite accessible by ferry. You know, the cheap flights probably weren't a big thing back then. Um, probably flights were more expensive then than they are now. Um, so it was a case of ringing the Welsh FA back then they would probably send you a application form. You'd fill everybody who was on your trip had to fill out what hotel and how you were getting to the destination. And um, obviously we had X amount of tickets available, but what we found back then, there was some games, certain games. Belgium was one of the biggest away followings around that time. I think we took in the region of 1,800, which was a big trip for Welsh fans around that time because I know that the following's a lot bigger now but um, it was you know it, it certainly was 1,800 was a lot of Welsh people to be traveling to um, another country and um, it wasn't so easy but it made it more adventurous I think and more fun um, there were certain games around the 90s where the Welsh FA would probably ring you up and say do you want tickets? Um, because there was plenty available. You know, the, the way followings ranged, uh, what I can recall, in the 90s. From 1,800, we think, I think we took the following away game. It was Germany, which was probably one of our biggest away followings in the 90s, 4,500. And then I've been to away games where there's probably bet anything between 60 and 100 Welsh away fans. Mm. You know, and people forget that, really, um, in this day and age. But, you know, at the time, the football wasn't probably as good as it is now. Mm. And, um, you know, I think more a lot more people in Wales um, follow football now, as maybe rugby was probably more popular in the 90s for people to attend rather than football. I think football for, was forgotten about in, by the media in Wales. Um, obviously, things have changed since 2016, but it was good because you got to know people back then, and that's 30 years ago, I think, to maybe last week it was. I've, I've even done a pin badge to to commemorate that um, trip away, which I'm wearing tonight. Oh, here we go. Uh, it's, a, it's a typical pint uh, that you get in Brussels, a bit of Belgian beer, and it's unbelievable that it's 30 years, I think, to this it's a match maybe that we played that game and it was quite a an important game for a lot of lads because it was maybe their first time traveling with Wales and as I say a lot of fans got the bug after that game and um you know and I still see the same lads and 
going to Wales away now that I do 30 years ago. Going on, keeping on to the early 90s of when you were starting in following Wales and that, um, the early 90s you, you had, you know, that Terry Yorif team. So you had the likes of uh, Ian Rush, Ryan Giggs, Gary Speed, Neville Southall, uh, David Phillips. Um, you had um, uh, probably uh, Chris Coleman and uh, Paul Bowden and all, all the, uh, Dean Saunders and all them lots, you know. So you must have seen the. Uh, you must have gone to watch uh, some famous games, you know, at uh, the old Cardiff Arms Park or the National Stadium, as it was called. Um, yeah. Especially the likes of, uh, you know, Wales beating Germany and, and Brazil. Um, those games that really stick out in my mind when people talk about the 90, early 90s, that is, uh, or yeah. the Terry yeah. era. But the one game I really want to mention, before I mention, you know, uh, Brazil and, and, and Germany, uh, Germany is, uh, of course, that uh, infamous uh, Romania game where Paul Bowden, who uh, mis- unfortunately missed a penalty and, and Wales were knocked out of the uh, of the World Cup. Uh, well, they, they weren't going to the World Cup in America. Um, did you go to that game? And also, um, what was it like as a fan uh, to be there when that happened? Um, yes, I was at the game and I had... Just- and looking back um, over the years, that was probably the most um, upset I've ever been watching Wales. I know we lost to Russia in the playoff game, but that wasn't so upsetting for some reason. Um, I think the Romania game and the whole the build up around it, a full house, a brilliant atmosphere, um, so much expectation because we did have a very good side back then with some world class players. Um, but maybe n- n- not enough um, world class players to take us through to a world a major final. Um, but I was absolutely heartbroken that night, and um, you know to t- to lose that way um, after Bowden hit the bar um, is probably one of the few occasions I've been to Cardiff for football and never wanted to go back out after a match. Um, for a pint, it was. I just wanted um, to get to my bed and get home, basically. And you know, it's obviously it, it, it rings true to this day. People still talk about that match now, and mm. it still breaks. It breaks your heart, really. What might have been because I was a big fan of Terry Orif back then as well. Um, because one, because I thought he was a he was a fantastic footballer, and he was a proud Welshman, and you know, he wore his heart on his sleeve playing for Wales as well as he did for, you know, being a manager for the national team as well. And we had some really five or six world-class players back then. And um, for them not to qualify for a major tournament, I bet that, I bet that, I bet they think about that to this day. And like, you know, it was the really an emotional night, I would say. And the first thing I did after the match, I, I, I stayed in my cousin's house who lived in Cardiff and I was straight back home, back in bed and, uh, on a bus back to Bala the following morning, like, you know. Did you, um, because uh, it was also infamous because uh, a, a fan uh, lost his life because of a, a, an incident that involved a flare. Did you, um, uh, I don't know if you were across the stadium or anywhere near, but did you saw a flare, the, the flares go off, you know, at the end of the game or during the game or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I saw the flare. I saw the flare and... Um, it didn't really, you know, the the significance of it. You did, you didn't really realize at the time, because you know there's always been flares at football. Maybe not so much in British grounds, but when you we used to watch Scoria and Italian football, especially, there was always flares going off. And I think because of what the results and it was the end of the game, somebody fly, fired a flare. Um, I wasn't really aware of the. Um, you know, what the magnitude of what actually happened after that. Really. My dad, who was at that game also, was sat in the same stand as where the um, the guy, unfortunately, lost his life. So he saw he saw more of it than I did, like, you know. And he refuses to talk about it, I bet, you know, considering... Yeah, he was never really spoke about at the time. You know, everybody was everybody was on a downer after losing that game. But it, in reality, somebody lost their life, and that's, uh, you know, that's... That should never have happened at football. Mm. And um, it became, you know, irrelevant to the, the losing, really. Um, obviously, we were all upset, but it put into reality that 
you know, the majority of us got home that night safely, like, you know. Yeah. Um, going on to uh, the, the Brazil and Germany game. Um, yeah. When when lockdown really started, um, yeah. when lockdown really began, the BBC Wales uh, featured uh, the Brazil and Germany game, which I thought was uh, a very nice touch. And um, and I think they even covered the 2016 games, you know, just to keep people's uh, hopes that one day we'll, we'll go back yeah. to watching. And it looks positive now in, in, in today's circumstances. But for you, um, what was it like to watch Wales? Especially, this is where I, I mean, when I grew up, because growing up when I I was fixated on players such as um, John Hart and Danny Gavadon, uh, Craig Bellamy and... Yeah. Bobby Savage and all those guys and Gary Speed. But I think um, g- going into the mid-2000s, you had young players like uh, Joe Ledley and obviously Gareth Bale, who's only a teen. You, some people call him a pup because he, he was basically a kid going into yeah. a first-team role, Chris Gunter and that. It, it was always daunting. Um, it, it always came to me uh, in some ways that how, how did we not get to a major tournament after 1958 you know the the plays that we had even to this day i know i'm proud of we're all proud of the the lads of 2016 you know for what they did you know but to not really qualify for major tournament considering that the players that we had in the early 90s well even go you have to go back in the 70s the 80s the 90s and everything some major superstars you just you do think to yourself well, how did that not happen? You know, because on pen and paper, it sounds fantastic too. It, it just seems to work. But when when the um, when it happened, when you guys went up against Brazil and Germany, um, I bet that was a big major shock to actually see Wales defeating, you know, two of the most highly decorated national teams in the world, considering that they made, they've won the World Cup uh, together, mm-hmm. combined of God knows how many what. So what was that like for you to see Wales you know, take them to the very end. You know, as as before your time, probably you know we, you know, winning winning the odd game was a bonus for us because um, you know we we lived through the gold years, probably gold years. Yeah, <laughs> and they, let's put it this way: they weren't the best, like. But um, you know, even uh, the Germany match to this day still sticks out in everybody's mind. And they were the world champions at the time. Um, and obviously for the Brazil game. And, you know, the, the potential to beat the biggest teams was Wales could do it on the day. But it was I think it was more to do with consistency. You know, we'd lose stupid games. Rather than lose big games, we'd lose to, uh, you know, smaller nations where we should have beaten them or at least got a draw. So... Winning the odd game, you know, at some stages, we were virtually out of the qualifying campaign halfway through, you know, and then you'd go to watch them away from home. And let's say we remember when we played Denmark and uh, we beat Denmark away 2-1. And, you know, you could see the delight in all the Wales away fans that beating somebody away was such a big thing back then we take the odd results. But if you look back at the Welsh national teams over the years, as I said before, we had world-class players, but we probably didn't have any luck either. Um, I think you need to ride your luck a bit on these occasions. And Wales didn't seem to have much in abundance, really. Because you mentioned Bobby Gold, I really want to mention, I mean, I was only a, a, a kid. I mean, I was born in 96. So, I mean, I was only born, what, a year into Bobby Gold's uh, management um, but for you, what was it? How frustrating was it to uh, to be watching, you know, Bobby Gold, a man who's who's had, who's just created a lot of um, stories, but yet they're not positive; they're more controversy or controversies, you know. And especially, uh, I, I'll never forget it was the one. Um, uh, funny enough, that Cumbrian Town have actually released on their YouTube <laughs> channel, and they beat him. It's like Wales high class players playing against Cumbrian Town. No, no disrespect to Cumbran Town, but then all of a sudden, Bobby brings himself on and scores a goal. I'm thinking, how the heck? What, wait a minute, hold the hold the brakes a minute. What's going on here? <laughs> it was, it, it was a, to be fair to him, he was a good header. Like, and I must say this about him. I know he's got a lot of bad press, but he bought us all a pint in Denmark after the game. You know, it, you know, we I remember that, but you know, when winning the odd game away was such a big thing for us then, and I think now the expectancy is a lot greater and we expect to 
to qualify for tournaments all the time now, but that's not football, you know. And I think we've we had a bit of a luck. We had a bit of luck along the way in Euro 2016, and we had a bit of a luck qualifying for this campaign. You know, I came back from Croatia and Hungary after two defeats, and somehow or other we still qualified. So I think things have moved on. Players are more professional. Um, I'd imagine Bobby Gould not being the most popular of managers. Some of those players possibly didn't really want to play for him mm. back then, and that probably didn't help our cause. So I think it's a lot to do with, you know, the manager and the coaching staff around him. If the players are happy with with the setup, they obviously want to play for Wales and win as well. So I'd imagine there was conflict within the camp, and. Um, you know, but you know, look at look at Terry Orrith, the brilliant um, servant for Wales as a player and a manager. But we just missed out, you know, uh, against Romania, and that's a real shame because I think that decide that side really deserved to qualify that time. Mm. You know, he's not much you can do when the penalty hits the crossbar, really. You know, so um, I think everything's got is more professional. I think the team spirit around Coleman was fantastic. And it brought out the best out of players who probably are, you know, world class, but they played as a team. Whereas previously, we might not always have played as a unit, like you know. Let's go on to um, the spirit of '58. Then uh, I don't know if it was uh, before or during the Euro 2016. So, could you tell us more about uh, what had happened and how did Spirit of '58 just come about, really? Um, I had the idea for a few years and it was just an idea. I was working full time and it, it was always an idea that, that I never did anything about for a couple of years. Um, but it started in 2010, which is obviously before the Euros. Uh, some people think I started it um, just before we qualified or when we qualified, but it was 2010 and I think we'd lost... An away game to Montenegro away. I was watching it on telly with my Bamf. I saw. I got to say this very quickly. Me, my Bamf's not the uh, diehard football fans, but he you watch if Wales are playing or yeah. if are playing, and he was watching it with me, and <laughs> and because in East Eastern European you got a lot of people that have their names finishing with V's on the end, so yeah. it could be yeah. Ekovic, Intovic, whatever. Uh, and my band was just <laughs> my band was just sat there going, bloody hell, there's more V's than a Vax Vulcan or something like that. And, no, said, and then and every time they pass it to him, when the commentator's not seeing their name, yeah. he, he's going, I bet his name ends in a V. I bet his name ends in a V. Oh, there's a Vich. Here comes a Vich. There's a Vich. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh, no. You know, it's games like that, you know, that we lost. And then you think to yourself, you know, the tournament hasn't exactly started yet, and uh, yeah, not the tournament, the um, you know the, the matches prior to the tournament, and uh, disappointing. But you know, we're quite a hardy bunch, the Welsh fans. I think from that my generation and the generation before, people you know sometimes forget that people started watching Wales in the early nineties away, but they didn't. You know, a, a small loyal bunch followed Wales in the eighties. And the seventies, you know, I love, I know a friend who followed Wales away since the late seventies. No longer with us now, but um, yeah, Montenegro, fantastic trip. But as somebody said, sometimes the match gets in the way of a good trip, like you know. So, um, so when it was after two thousand uh, and ten, when you started the spirit of fifty eight, did you knew that it, it was going to be this, you know, uh, big, important aspect of the Welsh fan system? Did you think that oh it's just a, it's just a little um, nice hobby or nice project that you just wanted to do and you just wanted to do well as as, as far as you can or whatever? So what was when when that um, following happened? Was you a bit surprised? Was you a bit taken back by it? Or you know what was your response? My biggest worry in Montenegro and there's picture somebody took a picture of me in the ground and then there was, you know we were upset that we lost and. Uh, I just ordered 100 T-shirts before going mm. in the hope that we'd come back with a bit of feel, bit of feel good factor. And um, so I was a little bit concerned coming home from Montenegro. I had 100 T-shirts to sell 
and they probably wouldn't sell, um, if that makes sense. And yeah. um, but they did, probably because I probably picked possibly one of the finest moments as a Welsh football fan. The first product that I did was a t-shirt, not a bucket act like a lot of people think. It was a t-shirt, and it was the lineup from when we beat England four one at the race course, mm. and. For Wales to beat England 4-1 back in 1980 at the race course, you know, people still talk about that game um, to this very day. And it hit home with a lot of Welsh fans, especially the hardcore Welsh fans, which probably numbered between, I'm guessing, four and 500 back then. Mm. Um, I put better than England in it on the T-shirt. Yeah. And it run through with a lot of people who were at that game. Um, our people, you know, have looked back and said, you know what, we gave England a good hiding that day. Um, not just because it was England, but you know, we you know, we we did give it a, a good English side, a, you know, a, a good job in, in England. So those t-shirts sold out very quickly and I ended up ordering more. So that's how Spirit of 58 started. And uh, that's how it grew from there. I, had, I invested the money I made on the t-shirts back into new products, and I still do that to this very day. So um yeah, I was taken aback, but I gained a lot of um, loyal support back then from people who used to go watch Wales away. And, um, you know, a lot of them now still stick by to what I do and stick with me and what I do now, which is over 10 years on, and the same people are buying my stuff. So I must be doing something right. You don't please everybody, but if you can please some, then you're doing something right the way I look at it. You know what? I've been looking for one of those bucket hats, the very popular ones with the the, the old Wales logo with the yeah uh, colours. Uh, do you still sell them now, or do you you want to move on from? I'm trying. I'm, I'm doing my best to move on, but it's difficult because one good thing about Welsh football fans, they like a drink, and they tend to lose them at a Wales away games. Mm. So they come home from, let's say, uh, Serbia or Montenegro or wherever. And then they'll get on to me and say, Tim, I left my bucket out in a, in a pub, in a bar in some far phone place. So or they give them away to one of the locals. And, um, you know, it's uh, never say never, isn't it? You know, we've got the Euros coming up in two months now, but um, I'm always trying to move on and create new, um, you know, new ideas and new products to keep things interesting because you've got to really, or you get, as I said before, you tend to get left behind. And um, I'm always thinking, as I told you previously, um, of the next product. My brain works all the time. So people might not think so that I sit on my bum all day in this shop. But I'm always thinking of the next product. And uh, obviously it helps when Wales are doing well because people buy into it then. And there's always somebody new who starts following the Welsh football. Mm. You know, for, for every... You know, every qualifying campaign, I've shown we've gained thousands of new fans. But, you know, I must admit that I have a very loyal customer base. And I've got to be thankful for that, that they stuck by me. And the fact I go to most home and away games, um, I think people appreciate that I do that as well. It, I just don't sit at home um, whilst Wales are playing on TV. Mm. And I'm actually there, so things may take a bit longer to come out like, you know? Will you ever, uh, if I give you an idea, I, or you must have thought this through, uh, I think it was that uh, famous uh, uh, picture that, that's that been going around. Someone told me to make it into a T-shirt, but I was a bit more cautious because uh, you're always on the ball getting some new ideas and content uh, going for your T-shirts or bucket hats. But it's that Ben Cabango uh, middle finger to one of the, the, the Mexican players. I've seen that, yeah, yeah. You got an idea for that? Yeah, I had an idea for it, but um, uh, what what would happen? My mum would tell me off, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and she still does to this day, believe it or not. <laughs> no, it's like someone, someone told me to turn that into a T-shirt, and I thought, oh, I don't know, because like I said, because you're on the ball with all your... Yeah. Uh, cause, well, there's uh, a lot more might... offensive T-shirts out there, I know that for a fact. Yeah. But, you know, my... My customers, the, the, the customer base of Spirit of 58 is, is it ranges from the father to the grandfather to the wife. And now there's a younger generation of people buying my stuff and the sons and the daughters buy my stuff. So mm. 
you've got to be careful what you do. But, um, you know, I'm trying to appeal to a broad church of Welsh fans and not just guys who are in their late 40s, early 50s like me. Because, um, you know, uh, fashion changes and you've got to go with the times, um, really. So the best, the, 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 the most current one I thought of was that block at the end of the uh, Czechoslovakia game. I thought that was a... That, could well be a, like it's a bit like the Ben Davis stop in the Euros against Slovakia. That could be one of those moments. Mm. So I'd like to do a design with that one because I think that Czechoslovakian side were a brilliant team, and that stop at the end of the game was so important. Like, and it could be, you know, it's taken us into the World Cup qualifiers for the rest of the World Cup qualifiers to Belarus, etc., with a lot of confidence and going into the Euros as well. We've got a good squad now, but. Um, um, it's um, it's one of those things, you know. If things happen during a Welsh game, then uh, pinnacle moments, important moments, then it always it can make for a design. You see. Mm. Um, at the same time, I wanted to know, uh, you know, ask about your experience during Euro twenty sixteen. Um, yeah. because, of course, I, I really wanted to go there. I mean, even if I couldn't get tickets, you know, I just wanted to go to either Paris or Marseille or yeah. Lyon or whatever, whatever the guys, wherever the players were playing. But um, how long did you stay out there for? And I heard you lost your passport as well. Uh, during that, that was quite, yeah, that was quite a, quite a story. That I went out for, the intention was to go out for the first three games, obviously, and stay in France. And I went with my wife and I went with my daughter who was only three years of age at the time so for somebody at the, the age of three to go to the Euros I hope when I've when I'm long gone she can talk about that two weeks to her uh, to people and say yeah I was at the Euros in 2016 when I was three years of age with my dad um so it was a it was a proud moment and we went we traveled around France for those three games and um, we had a fantastic time with friends. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, you just can't, you, you can describe it, but you, you, I could probably talk about France and that period um, in the Euros. Um, you know, it could make a book, to be honest, um, about the stories. And it was just great. You'd be walking in, in the centre of Bordeaux and you just bump into people that you knew all the time, you know, throughout the day. and. Uh, you know, you, you look back at moments and um, there's not many three-year-old kids who can say they were out and about the day that we played Russia mm. um, because there was a lot of, you know, there was a bit of tension before that game because of what the Russians did um, to the England fans um, at the time. And, um, and I was a bit, I, I wasn't apprehensive for myself, but my daughter was with me in a restaurant, uh, my wife, and we were with a group of friends. There must have been 30 of us. Ian Rush was in the in the, the, ne the restaurant next door to us. And I just, you know, I just thought, you know, this is something for a three-year-old to be here and uh, be part of it. But I packed my daughter off and my wife in the taxi back to the campsite if, as the day progressed because you were just a little bit wary of what might happen but it didn't, and the Russians were absolutely fine. So um, I think you'll never beat Bordeaux. I know you said you went there, but as a Welsh fan who's followed in quite a few years, to be st stood in that ground amongst people that you followed the Wales with for the last 30 years, and to see a lot of grown men in tears when the border, when the when the anthem came on. I looked around me and there's a lot of people I knew in tears because it meant that much to them just to be there. And I'd never expected us to win, um, you know, all those games and qualify for the uh, knockout stages. So I came home after the first three games and what was good, my wife um, was in the hotel. She came to the Bordeaux game because we had a babysitter, believe it or not, on our campsite. Stand, but she didn't come to the second or the third game and she was on her laptop in the hotel room booking my next trip so I said once we went 2-0 up against Russia um, book the next flight 
so bless her, she was in the hotel room with my daughter. I was at the match and she sent me a text saying, do you want me to book your flights to the next game? And I said, yeah, once it goes 2 if it if, if it goes 2 nil, book it quick because, you know, the demand was there for the next game. And I and I went back to each of the knockout games with me, with with the group of lads and um, we went to and from. We had a great time as well. It was a, it was a fantastic uh, few weeks, though, you know. So what, what happened with the passport then? Uh, what 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 went wrong, you know? And was it trying to get out of France or was it trying to get back into France or something? Or uh... Somebody did say to me, I'm, and um, said to me, who's involved with the Far Wells fans away, I've never known anybody lose their passport when they got home. <laughs> so work that one out. It was in quite a, they usually lose it in the country they've been. Yeah. But to cut a long story short, we arrived back in, I think it was Birmingham Airport. It was busy. We had two suitcases and a bag. The first train we got on back to into Wales was cancelled. We had to run off that train onto the next train. It was all a bit mad, it was. And um, and the volume of commuters, it was all full of commuters, not Welsh football fans. It was commuters. And I didn't realise I'd left my rucksack in the top, you know, when you the part of the train where you leave your luggage. Mm. That's where I left it, but I didn't know that until um, I actually got home back to Bala and I said to my wife, where's the rucksack? Because it had the iPad, it had three passports, and it had all the vouchers to the final, the follow your team vouchers. Mm. So those... That 24 period after I got home was probably one of the worst periods of my life, certainly. <laughs> and um, it's a long story, but I basically I had to get an emergency passport because I had to be in Paris for the the game against Northern Ireland mm. in 48 hours. So you can imagine the stress involved. Um, but um, it put faith in human nature because the bag was found, believe it or not, in Pushelli station, which I believe is the end of the line of that train. And the guard on, on that evening found my rucksack. It was totally intact and everything was in the bag. And it got returned to me. But in the meantime, it, I was already on my way to Paris on the plane with an emergency passport. So when I got off the flight, I must have had about 50 missed calls to say everything's been found. But it was too late for my passport, my, my old passport. But one of my mates was flying out to Paris the following morning and he brought out the um, voucher for that game the following morning. I met yeah. up with him. But all's well, that ends well. It just, you know, it was the worst of two two day period and um, the best really because I was back in Paris the eve of the Northern Ireland game and I got... and. Um, Everybody was, um, everything was fine in the end. And it made the front page of the, the Daily Post up here. So um, in a good way, because I think it made people aware that I'd lost my bag. Mm. That's probably what helped to find it, really. So, uh, you know, everybody rallied around me. It was great, like, you know. Did you go to the Belgium game as well? Or Yeah, I was at the Belgium game. That was some game as well. We were right on the top of the stand, the Welsh end right on the top on the second tier. And one of the goals went in and there was about six or seven of us. And we're not the smallest of chaps, some of us. And, you know, as you do, you celebrate and you all jump on each other. One of us tripped and we ended all falling into the next row of seats. Yeah. The lady in front of us wasn't too pleased, but I said, we've just probably beaten the best team in possibly the world then. And uh, we're very sorry. And, um, but she didn't see the funny side. But there we are. You can't win, can you, all the time? No. And uh, just uh, I, I, I know it's uh, upsetting that we we lost in the semi-finals. But at the same time, it's a uh, it's a thrill to actually even get to the semi-finals, considering of how uh, chances were. I mean, a lot of people were not on odds against uh, you know in for us. I think a lot of people were expecting us to be out around the same time Northern Ireland ones. But then again, uh, a lot of people were saying that about Iceland. Um, I, I was just baffled how uh, uh, anyone who's, who's from England who does watch this, but I was completely baffled when they were going, how dare Wales, the Welsh players, celebrate uh, Iceland beating England, you know, and I'm going, well, you don't really support us, so uh, 
where's where's the, the cal- where's the solution is that what where where do we stand on that? But I just thought fair play to the players, you know, because Iceland are even Wales. I mean, they were the underdogs at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a Welsh thing, I think, you know. I think I've got friends from over the border. And um, to be fair, I think in the Euros, I think because of the the support that we had over there, the way we played, um, a lot of people who follow, um, you know, the English national side did actually want us to, to um to win the people I knew anyway, but um, uh, in a way that losing to England on that day after we took the lead uh, when Bale's you know scored that goal was a really tough one to take, but I think that spurred us on to play one of the best football matches I've ever seen against Russia, one of mm-hmm. the best Wales performances anyway, and everybody said oh it's not a very good Russian side, but we took them apart that night. You know everybody was a bit down after the England game. But even in France, I met England fans from Sunderland, Fulham, QPR, Middlesbrough, and they were fine. It might have been a different story if we'd have beaten England that day. I think there was, you know, a lot of lads around that day, uh, English lads, and the atmosphere would have been a bit different. But, um, you know, we didn't see any bother over in um, France. And uh, I think, you know, the Welsh, maybe we got a bit of chip on our shoulder about the English, but we're only a small country. and. Um, you know, as somebody said to us, it's little old whales punching above their weight. So, you know, um, you know, we've beaten bigger and better sides than England since then. So um, there we are. That's football. Going on to very quickly, just going back in time for a moment, uh, for a bit, because um, when John, uh, I, we we can not mention this man uh, without mentioning uh, Chris Coleman and and. Uh, the Euro 2016 squad. And I think, you know, who I'm going to mention is Gary Speeds, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. I mean, he was the guy who, well, a lot of people say John Toshik was the one because he brought in all the youngsters, which is the likes of Gareth Bale, Ramsey, yeah. uh, Gunter, which I'll give Toshak credit for. But I think it yeah. was, I think it was Gary Speed who, who glued everything together and made it, you know, a promising young um, upcoming if not daring team to to go on and, and face the world, you know, without yeah. any problems. So did you have, um, cause I, the thing about Gary Speed is a lot of people seem to be forgetting that Gary Speed didn't come from a, a proper managerial background yet because he was only manager at Sheffield United for roughly four to five months. So it was a big gamble to say the least. Yeah. Was, was you, was you a bit doubtful when Gary Speed took, took the job? Um, I wouldn't say doubtful. Obviously, as you say, the experience might not have been there. But he, again, he was another passionate Welshman. Um, he played with his heart for his country, and um, and I admire the Welsh Football Association for giving him a go, giving young talent a go. Like, and I always admire Gary Speed a lot because I've seen him a few times in an airport following Wales after he retired from being a player. So he went as a fan. And I always admire that. Like, so I had a lot of time for Gary Speed, mm. like many of us did. So, you know, I think the Welsh FA got more professional and they certainly give young, talented people a chance. And, you know, he didn't start off very well. But, you know, I think we're too quick these days to want to get rid of people. And then Gary Speed pre- pre- proved people wrong, like Chris Coleman did, because... Um, Certainly after when we lost that game to Serbia and everybody wanted Chris Coleman's head. But, you know, it shows that with a little bit of patience. Um, I think it does help. You've got it all. Uh, to me, it always helps if you've got a passionate Welshman in, in charge. And Gary Speed was. Terry Yorath was. Chris Coleman was. You know, gigs, it's, it's divides opinion. Um, but I think Coleman... You know, he proved a lot of people wrong. And I think he built a very strong team ethic um, amongst the squad. And I think the spirit was there from the coaching staff to the background staff, right up to the captain. So everybody wanted to play for Chris Coleman. And if the players like the manager, I'm a, I'm a big believer that will spur your team on. You know, mm. he was a people person and he engaged with the fans as well. Because there aren't too many managers who actually got out there and went to all parts of Wales, <coughs> excuse me, to in, to meet fans along the way as well. 
Mm. And that, I think, is an important thing. You know, I still think it's an important thing now that, you know, if Paige gets the job now as full time, I hope he gets out there and goes to all parts of Wales, um, north, south and mid, and goes to meet the fans because um, I'm a big believer that he'll do well as well because, you know, he did his best for Wales as well. So I think it's not always the case. You, 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 you get a big signing, a big time manager who maybe has no connection with Wales whatsoever. So I think it's maybe, if you can, where possible, to keep it in-house, like, you know, and uh, Paige is proving that now, isn't he? Yeah. I, I I remember talking about it with my mate Luke Williams, and um, yeah. I, I, I said about it with uh, uh, with him when he, he asked me on, on the previous episode. Well, funny enough, um, as, as we're speaking now, the episode's not being released yet, but um, he was asking me, um, about Ryan Giggs and the position that he's in now. And I turned around and said, look, um, I can't really say much about his personal life issues at the moment because we, we don't know that we don't know both sides of the stories. It's just a he oh. said, she said uh, moment, you know. But I did turn around and, and said, if you're there to do a job, you're supposed to do a job. You can't just put that to one side to focus on you know, on the situation, you just got to keep going until, you know, your, your day is coming court. And yeah. he said, and as with Ryan Giggs, you know, he's supposedly at the helm and uh, he, he, and in all fairness, he, he did win, win back the people of Wales when he, well, he's qualified first for the Euro. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I can't fault him there, but the yeah. problem you got is that this is his second time now that he's missed another international duty and I yeah. and I and I feel that when's the next international duty now? Is it the following month or is it this month? Uh, well, there's a friendly to come next month, isn't there? Before we go to the Euros. Yeah. So I mean, coming up to the Euros, and especially we're having a friendly against Albania. I think it is. Uh, That's you know, the one, yeah. if he's not going to be there for the Albania game, then the FEW just needs to turn around and say, "Look, we, we hired you to do a job. I know you got some personal issues, but you still got to do a job. We need someone yeah. to do that." And we got the Euros coming up. So what are you yeah. doing? So we're just going to cut all ties and you, you just got to go off and find somewhere else because we, we yeah. need someone there and give that to Rob Page. And the amount of people that were saying about Rob Page saying, oh, he's not the right manager. It's like, well, how do you know he's not the right manager? People have said that about mm-hmm. Chris Coleman. People have said yeah. that about um, Gary Speeds. He could have potentially done it and he was getting there. All right, people can say that about John Toshak, but... Uh, <laughs> Or even, but I, I had assumed that to, um, Terry Yorff must have had that scene back in the day, you know, and you, you got to give that benefit of the doubt. And the thing is, Rob Page has only lost one game as he's yeah. been in, in charge. So no, he's done a fantastic job and yeah. you've got to hire him. And in my opinion, it might not, not everybody will agree with me. I think he's the man to take us to the Euros. I know, I agree. I, I totally, totally agree with you. Do you know what I was saying as well? We got Because we got Paul Bowden as the under-21s manager. That's correct, yeah, yeah. I, as long as you can show him how to take penalties. Yeah. <laughs> I bet he's not t- 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 training them to take the penalties. Someone else could do that. But, I mean... Yeah, I'll sin for that. <laughs> imagine, oh, it's like Paul Bowden takes over his Mills management job and we'd go for a penalty show and we go, oh, bollocks, here we go. <laughs> I'd leave the ground early, I think. It was like, right, come on. <laughs> but, no, I think Paige is the man now. He's proven that he's, you know, he's doing a good job. Um, and I think the, the the whole Welsh football national team setup before going to the Euros, you know, um, needs somebody stable and reliable mm. because you know, he's, he's done a job. He's done a job. So I don't know the ins and outs of Ryan Giggs' personal life and has nothing to do with me. But he became, you know, qualifying for, for the Euros when we didn't really, you know, we didn't have much faith really and he turned it around. So... You've got to admire him for that to that point, but this personal issue is not helping anybody really. So I think the sooner we make a decision in regards to Paige, the better we can move on. Yeah, no, I, like I said, I agree with you. And it's it, it happens. It's not it's not just in um, in in Wales uh, Welsh football as well. It can happen anywhere, right? When what's that? Of course, it can happen. You know, yeah. it, you it know. can happen uh, anywhere. But when you're when you're working for a company, mm-hmm. and you're missing out on work because of this. 
the bosses, are, they can't just keep turning around and saying, all right, we'll, we'll give you another extra days off because of reason, mm -hmm. you know, where mm -hmm. you could be an important figure like Giggs, who's the manager of the Welsh national team, you know, yeah. you're important and you're, and you're missing out. You're supposed yeah. to be at the helm with this, but you're not there. Yeah. It's like, where, where'd you go? You can't go, you can't take two steps forward. You got to take a step for, um, you can't take two steps back. You got to take a step forward, you know? So, uh, yeah. Oh. I think you know, because Paige has done so well, then give him a go. Mm. You know, we, we've done well to qualify for this campaign under the circumstances. I think people sometimes forget that as well, because when I came home from Hungary, I thought we were down and out. But, you know, we, we've, we're playing, we've get, we're grinding out results, and I don't care how we play as long as we get the results. You know, we're a small nation, and we're punching, you know, to a degree, but I think people sometimes, since 2016, expect too much of the national side, um, which a younger generation might think that, you know, we're rubbish because we don't qualify. But it's tough out there, international football. Mm. And um, I think, come on, get Paige in and let's give these Euros a good goal, like, you know, because yeah. our expectations go into France, where we were just happy to be there. But obviously, expectations are a little bit higher now. But it's a tough group that we're in and every international game is tough um maybe if we play san marino i might change my mind but generally they're all tough games now so i think give page a go and um let's get a bit of stability and confidence going into to the euros really with um they must the players must want to play for him because we're winning games simple as that yeah i think a final question now for you tim and thank you so much for coming on the dragon Source right. podcast um, so the final question is for you is what does the future hold for you and uh, Spirit of 58? Is it going stronger? Is there more to come? What's the bottom line? Well, I'm not going to give up on it. Um, you know, the times where we didn't qualify for Russia, which was a bit of a setback, and then people doubted that I could carry on. But then we qualified after that. So it's not just a, I've got a very, as I said previously, I've got loyal people who stick by me and they buy my product the same people, but I gain new customers because I try and keep the product range different. I've got my shop in Bala, which, believe it or not, people travel far and wide as far as, you know, especially between the lockdowns, people rallied around me. Mm. Um, and I enjoy being in a shop because you never know who you're going to meet. And, um, you know, um, I meet all types of people, all types of Welsh fans from all over Wales. You know, people have travelled as far as Cardiff, as far as Yorkshire. Um, you know, they don't just come from the Ballard area. It's a, it's throughout Wales and beyond. Like I've had people from all over the world in normal times who had a Welsh connection, who obviously followed Wales as well or have a longing for Wales. But I do get asked, you know, some silly questions in the shop, but there we go. Um, I have thought about diversity, diversifying to selling Wellingtons, but I'd be treading on people's toes in Ballard then, wouldn't I? But, uh, you know, it's, I enjoy the shop and, you know, this is my full-time job. So I've got a family to, to support. So that's why I put a lot into it as well. And the fact that I enjoy it and I enjoy meeting people as well and doing things like this keeps, keeps me sane as well. So it's been difficult in lockdown because I didn't see anybody for four months, really. Mm. And we've had some, I think it's bad news today that we won't be able to travel to Italy because it's Italian-based uh, fans only. Mm. There's 25%. We had a bit of hope yesterday that there was going to be a 25% capacity. And now they've said it's only going to be home-based supporters. And for people like me who've kept their tickets to the Euros up to this very day, I was still hold, holding on to hope that we were going to go to Azerbaijan and Rome, so I might just have to give them up this week, which I'm really disappointed about tonight because, you know, we live in hope, don't we? And um, mm. while there's hope, we keep on going. But um, it'll be a strange Euros because I'll have to watch it in the pub uh, back here now, whereas I'd normally be on the other side of the world watching it, you know. And for me, watching Wales away is all about meeting, meeting new people and making new friends, like having fun. 
Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on the Dragon's Voice podcast to talk about um, the Spirit of 58, your experiences of uh, being a Wales fan and that. And it's good to hear, you know, not just former footballers or current footballers, but just fans in general. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. No worries. And thanks very much to you for giving me the time, innit? No problem at all. So, uh, guys... be watching EastEnders, don't it? <laughs> oh, hey. oh, yeah. Trust me. Or oh, otherwise, I'd be putting it on Netflix or I'd be going on to Sky Sports watching the Premier League years. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, it's nice to do different things, isn't it? Oh, yes. And so, guys, that was us on the uh, Drag Voice podcast. Make sure you like, share, subscribe to the channel. Make sure you ring the bell to keep yourself notified. Thank you so much for Sacco Sportswear for supporting us. You know, they are our sponsors. So make sure you check them out. The link is in the below to go and check out what they do and what they sell. And also we'll be on uh, Podbean as well. So you just keep following us and keep supporting us. And I, I promise you we'll get better content and more uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. But for now, thank you so much for tuning in to the Dragon's Voice podcast. I've been your host, Julie Reese Deans, and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.